So why do we inspect? Um, it's to avoid issues like this. Um, steel, concrete, timber, it all degrades over time due to various different uh, mechanisms. To give you an idea, this pole here um, was in the news um, about a year, two years ago maybe. It was on the Anzac Bridge in Sydney, peak hour traffic. Um, it actually fell across the pedestrian walkway on the side of the bridge. And that um, bridge, all the poles along that bridge had been inspected within the year previous and they had actually replaced a lot of them. But this one was missed. And as you can see there, even though um, you know, it looks pretty good on the outside, there's, it's a very small area of corrosion, but just completely corroded through. Um, so we really need to be designing for durability if we can. There's actually there's methods for designing this and, and installing it that would eliminate that issue. Okay? That's your first port of call. But we're here to talk more about the, the inspection side of things. So um, what we're finding now is, and I deal a lot in the wood pole space, that's where the, the media attention seems to be, but what we're finding is we're actually, there's more steel poles falling over than there are wooden poles falling over in Australia at the moment. So, and the issue is, a lot of them aren't doing it at ground line, they're doing it three to four hundred millimetres below ground. So, about five years ago I actually went um, on a bit of a journey around the world to try and find something where I could inspect steel poles below ground without having to dig. And um, we did actually find something and you can come and look at that on the stand if you want but that is the biggest issue at the moment is poles that are falling over um, even when people are inspecting them the majority of inspectors just turn up um, they look at the pole and do a visual around ground line they might put a, a uh, an ultrasonic thickness gauge on around ground line somewhere all good walk away and pole falls over a year later. So I'll just touch on concrete quickly because it's one that doesn't really come into what the majority of you guys would be doing, but concrete's still a pretty basic material in terms of inspection. There isn't a lot out there that can inspect concrete and give you a residual strength or actually find corrosion before it gets to the point where you actually start spalling. Um, obviously cracking like this is, is signs of corrosion um, but we still just use visual techniques for concrete. Um, it tends to give us a little enough warning that we can replace it before they start. Um, this is one of the exceptions. Um, this is the first time I ever came across uh, black rust. This was a pole that was being tested, we actually destructively tested this pole in ground um, because it had a fair bit of corrosion um, or a bit of rust staining anyway and some, a little bit of cracking on the surface showing up about a metre, metre and a half above ground line. Um, the asset owner was interested in it so we pulled it over and it broke at a quarter of its original design capacity. And the reason is the reason we didn't get as much warning with that as what you normally would is they're actually getting moisture on the inside coming up from ground level and it was being drawn through by the sun and it dissolves the steel. It doesn't actually create uh, what you would call normal rust, uh, iron oxide, it creates another type of um, corrosion where it just dissolves the steel and that leaches out and as soon as it hits the air, it turns into the, the orange rusty colour. But when it's inside the, the concrete, it's black. And it doesn't have the volume associated with it that normal rust does. So you don't get the same warning with it. So that's something to watch out for. Um, you can actually get it in culverts and all sorts of stuff as well. In terms of wood, um, there are a lot of different inspection systems out there for wood now. Um, 
a lot of councils still just send someone out there with a hammer and do a visual and that's it. Um, that won't fly if something falls over and you get sued. Um, and trust me, you, you don't want to be in that space. Um, the seismic vibration ones are a very quick tool. They do a very initial uh, quick scan. Um, you get a pretty good picture of what's happening inside the pole, but you don't know where the, the issue is if it finds one. So they tend to be a first pass. If it's green, you keep going. If it's red, you stop and do a bit more investigation. Um, density meters, they essentially look at the, the density of the timber, um, particularly in the outer um, diameter, and it allows you to find where that issue is normally. So they're sort of the next level of inspection. Um, and then tomography, Tomography, uh, normally acoustic tomography, they actually put nails in the, the timber and it sends acoustic signals between different nails and you build up a profile of what's happening inside the timber. So that is to really quantify how much section you've got left at once you've found where your worst section is with these other two. Radar, a little bit bulky, um, not really practical at this stage. Proof loading, there's plenty of devices out there to do that. Uh, there's a number of issues with them. They tend to be the most accurate in terms of residual strength determination, but it takes a long time to do it and they do have their, their downsides. They do miss stuff as well. Um, anyone that tries to sell you a drill that, that'll tell you how good the timber is, just tell them to move on because it doesn't help you in any way whatsoever over your normal inspection practices. Um, I just wanted to throw this in there too. There's a lot of focus in inspectors. They'll, they'll talk about this good wood measurement. And with timber, basically, you can have 20 millimetres of good wood left around a pole and you've still theoretically got half your original strength. And we build a lot of factor safety into our timber pole. So measuring good wood tells you nothing until you're at the point where you could almost put a hammer through the pole anyway when you're inspecting it. Okay? So you need a bit more warning, you need a bit more smarts in there to actually give you a proper idea of what, what is remaining. So that there is the point at which most utilities will actually replace their poles, theoretically. Um, there's a lot of focus on stuff that just doesn't make any difference in, the, in that industry. To give an idea, um, out of these two poles, the one on the right is actually the weakest one out of the two, basically the same size. Uh, that one looks worse, but that one there is completely um, inhabited by uh, what we call carroty rot or soft rot internally. Um, soft rot, really hard to detect. Um, it stays really hard in compression, but it fractures really easily in tension. So you're talking eight to 10 MPa in tension versus the normal 80 MPa in tension, okay? That's the biggest issue facing the industry at the moment. Um, uh, another couple of examples of just how hard it can be to, to assess wood poles. Um, these next two poles are basically visually very similar on the outside. That's the cross section near failure of this particular one. That pole broke at 10 kilonewtons tip load, horizontal tip load. This pole here, very similar again, but when you get to the cross section, a little bit more timber loss, but you've also got the soft rot in the timber that is remaining. And that one, oops, sorry. That one broke at 3.8 kilonewtons. So big difference, not much difference on the outside and they wouldn't have sounded that much difference with a hammer either. Yeah. This just gives you an idea of one of the seismic devices and one of the um, density meters, the type of devices that you're looking at and the type of signals you get back. Uh, that's your acoustic tomography device there. 
and this is one of your true flow devices. Very different range of technologies. You've got to know what you're trying to get out of it before you decide which one to use. So on the steel, first thing is, if you've got any sort of flange mounted poles, um, particularly with steel in the ground section, try and design it so you've got at least 150 mil clearance between that flange and the ground line. Okay, if you don't have that, it makes it really hard to inspect and you've got to dig anyway. And you also end up with things like crevice corrosion up underneath that, um, that flange plate. So this here is actually a seven year old pole that we inspected. Um, don't powder coat your, your steel below ground line, it's just useless. Um, that's, the powder coating is actually creating a worse environment for corrosion than what it would be without the powder coating on there. Okay? The, the galvanising would last better without it on there. Um, and it actually, if you get any sort of earth leakage or any sort of current in the pole, you get accelerated corrosion where there's a hole in that coating. Okay. Inspection below ground. Um, generally it is ignored. Um, you can't do it like this, but there's really only one option um, that we found, and that's the, the guided wave ultrasonics. The, the ultrasonic thickness testing and the pulse eddy current are good for, well, pulse eddy current won't do anything for that. Pulse eddy current looks at the mass of steel in a region, and um, what the way you do it is a relative loss of section. So you take a measurement where you know there's no corrosion, and then you take a measurement at the ground line and compare the two. In this case here, because you've got the flange, uh, the base plate there, it's going to throw off the readings. There's too much steel in that area compared to where you would normally take your reference reading. So pulse eddy current has its place. It's used quite a bit in the UK. Um, but it doesn't get very far below ground line. You're talking 100 millimetres at most and has issues with certain steel thicknesses. Um, ultrasonic thickness testing, that's where that's what we would use for that sort of situation there. Um, it will give you a pretty good idea of corrosion at that, that interface there. Um, but guided wave ultrasonics is where we go for the below ground stuff. Um, we also, ultrasonics, there's two types. Um, there's a contact uh, ultrasonics where you need an ultrasonic gel to, what's well, basically piezo um, ultrasonics. You shoot the sound into the steel. With the gear that we use, we actually, it's essentially dry coupled. Um, we generate the sound within the steel itself. So there's two very different technologies out there. The, EMAT technology, which is the, the one that generates the sound inside the steel. Uh, that is a bit quicker, but it also generates a sound mode or a sound wave inside the steel that doesn't attenuate as much um, when the steel's in contact with the ground and with concrete and things like that. So it'll penetrate further below ground. To give you an idea, that's what I'm talking about there. So the piezo, normal ultrasonic thickness gauges and things like that, they use a couplet. Whereas EMAP, um, it generates the sound in the steel using the Lorentz force, which is an interaction of a magnetic and electric field. Um, you can use EMAP for both thickness testing and guided waves, but the majority of time we use it for, for guided waves in this application. So what we do is basically you, you have a, a sensor above ground and you're shooting sound along the steel. It's as simple as that. And then all we're doing is we see um, the initial pulse and we see a reflection from wherever there's corrosion. You get an idea of how bad the corrosion is, but we always um, try and confirm that or calibrate it so we can uh, categorise the, the condition of that pole um, without taking a thickness measurement because this, this technology doesn't really give you a residual thickness. It'll just tell you 
give you an idea of the severity of it. <coughs> so that is a, a picture we took yesterday out the front. Um, that pole there out the front of the, the building, it shouldn't actually be in there anyway. It's been hit by a couple of cars by the look of it. And it looks like they used a panel beater to bash it back into a rough shape. Um, but this is the sort of signal we get. So the middle there is where we put a strip on the pole. We put a magnetostrictive strip on there. Um, and you're shooting to the left there is above ground, to the right is below ground. Okay? And it's this heat map. Um, vertically there is around the circumference. And that heat map shows you where the, the corrosion is. Now you will pick up um, the cable entry points and holes in the pole and you pick up welded attachments and things like that but when we have a baseline to work off we can tell what's what so we can detect the, the actual corrosion separately. 